how do I even start this review? How about... I'm a huge Batman fan. My first exposure to the titular character was through the Justice League animated series. Since then, I have watched various movies, read a few of the comics, but not as many as Spider-Man or Star Wars, and I've played more than a handful of the games since the early 2000s. But this game, this game, not only put Batman games on a pedestal, but also revived the superhero game genre. Just a quick history lesson, the superhero genre hadn't significantly impacted the video game landscape in earlier years. Those I did play usually ranged from pretty okay to so unplayable that I couldn't even finish the second level. There are spectacular games like Spider-Man 2, but its successors went downhill from there. The Batman Arkham series dared to defy the mediocre trend, becoming a cornerstone in the superhero market and video games. So to show my love for Batman and this series of games, we will look at the quadrilogy, I say quad reluctantly, starting with the first game in the series, Batman Arkham Asylum. It's a third person action game developed by the British company Rocksteady Studios. You play as Bruce Wayne, aka Batman, as he fights and sneaks his way through his rogues gallery and the lesser henchmen in Arkham Asylum, a maximum security center parading as a rehabilitation center. I know that's not what it's supposed to be, but I'm just being honest. One of these rogues, the Joker, aka who gives a crud, stages a hostile takeover of Arkham Island, kidnapping or killing whoever is in the way. Your job is to stop Joker and find out why he's taken over Arkham. Just a quick disclaimer, I played this game on PC, but played most of the game with an Xbox 360 controller, which I'm most comfortable with. Playing through its successor with a keyboard and mouse, I can say that this method is also very viable. Also, I haven't encountered any significant technical issues, save for an occasional crash that only happens after putting in many hours. Now, let's start with the presentation. Though released in 2009, the environments and graphics hold up really well. For a game with the word asylum in it, you'd think all you would see are the various medical facilities and the outdoor areas, and those are there. But there's plenty of variety with ancient ruins, a botanical garden, and dimly lit sewers. There may have been glimpses into Arkham Asylum before this, but this feels expansive and lived in. A place you can go to. But it's not a bright colorful romp. The art style and color palette give off a dark, dirty, almost horror meets noir vibe with some hints of cell shading if you look close enough. Not the flowers. Ignore those. Stop zooming in! What sticks out is how Arkham changes as the story progresses. You'll see guards stationed in certain areas, or save hostages from violent beatings and deaths. It makes the initial playthrough seem like everything is under control. Yet, after completing some tasks, those same areas will show these same people dead on the floor or strung up. Enemy snipers take over the towers and can take a chunk of your health away. You will even see a statue defaced or certain parts of Arkham renovated by criminals. It adds to the feel of Arkham as a place, and the safety you may initially feel slowly diminishes as criminals start running the show. The sound design is good, especially in combat, emphasizing Batman's punches while criminals hitting Batman are a bit wimpish. And when delivering a takedown or final punch, there's a subtle... It's a superhero game though, so everybody recovers. Weapons are also distinct, especially the cues of reloading and shooting, a metal pipe's subtle vibrations, or a stun baton shock. Plus, the visual disorientation is a nice touch. They're reminders that Batman is a durable guy, but not invulnerable. The music serves some purposes here and there. My favorite has to be this moment. Such a great use of suspense and... Wait, how can two crazy people be in the same cell and not rip each other to shreds? That's literally impossible. There are other epic moments like these, and the bosses also have their own themes. Mostly, you'll hear the tunes for either combat or predator encounters. Oh, 
I'm not scared of you. I wish there were more variety, like maybe a different predator theme for the medical center or intensive treatment, but they do well in adding the needed feel for each encounter. Finally, let's talk about the characters. Batman's appearance is prominent since he takes up a quarter of the screen, but also he's the one that goes through the most changes, his suit becoming scraped and his body scarred, his cape ripped and worn. Besides him, everyone else has a consistent design. Joker looks as he does in many iterations. Killer Croc is… kind of a behemoth. Scarecrow is a literal scarecrow. Bane is a spoiler. But then there are questionable designs like Harley Quinn as a lustful nurse and not a Harley Quinn. And Ivy's old appearance now being more modest compared to… whatever this is. In my opinion, what carries the characters are the spectacular voice performances and personalities. From the Batman and Justice League animated series, Kevin Conroy and Mark Hamill reprised their roles as Batman and Joker respectively. They are THE Dreamcast, even when they're acting out of character at times. There's no escape, Joker. I will find you. Oh, I'm counting on it. Just not yet. Seeing as how I'm feeling generous, I'll give you this one for free. Knock me off! I dare you. End this! Pull the plug! Stop me once and for all! <laughs> Batman, please make up your mind. Besides that little stint, Conroy brings that stoicism and calm I would expect out of Batman, while Hamill sounds like he's having way too much fun in the booth. Batman, what are you d uh, I'm sorry, I kinda never thought you were real. What's happening? Joker seize control of the island. Stay here and keep a lookout. Blackgate prisoners are roaming free. Don't let them get close to you. You won't stand a chance. Anyone seen the big bad bat? I warn you, he may look like an idiot and talk like an idiot, but don't let that fool you. He really is an idiot. <laughs> the other main characters are well voiced, especially the legendary Arlene Sorkin, reprising her role as Harley Quinn from the animated series. She still conveys the obsessive and chaotic personality many Batman fans know Harley for, while kicking it up a notch in spite of the grimmer setting. Ah, 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 B-Man! Mr. J doesn't want you following us just yet! There's also Barbara Gordon, aka Oracle, played by Kimberly Brooks. She's mainly a voice in Batman's ear, but she gives some insights into the happenings outside of Arkham, and research that helps bring greater context to the story. That's not all he's done. All police feeds are reporting he's placed bombs all over Gotham. Says he'll detonate them if anyone sets foot on Arkham Island. It's being suppressed at the moment, but the story will break any time now. For secondary characters, they range from pretty good to okay at best. The poor lip syncing of the in game models doesn't help much either. What happened? Joker happened. You're lucky to be alive. He must have gone this way. Door's jammed. I'll try and get it open. Thanks. Where did Dr. Young go? I told her to run. These guys came in looking for her. I told her to go to her office and hide. Does she keep her records there? I guess. She was pretty desperate to get in there. Her office is over there. They didn't sour my experience, but most are forgettable compared to the main characters. Now, to the meat of this review. The most impactful factor that spread from the Arkham series into many others. The gameplay. This is primarily because of the combat and predator sections, which are easy to get into, but so satisfying to master. First though, let's talk about exploration. While not as expansive as later titles, Arkham Asylum sets a pretty good foundation for them. 
When out of the starting area, intensive treatment, you could explore the island at your leisure and take in the sights, especially the outskirts. It's hard to tell if it's a render background or an actual level they built for sightseeing alone. Exploring the various buildings and crevices leads to combat or predator encounters, boss fights, or investigations. Investigations are all the same. Find the item and follow its scent or fingerprints to the next location. It's serviceable, but I expected something noteworthy from the world's famous detective, next to the likes of Holmes and Poirot. There is a diversion that can break things up. The Riddler Trophies. By whatever means, Riddler hit a bunch of trophies and identified many riddles to solve. He even tasks you to destroy the chattering teeth Joker left all over the island. It's not just Riddler questions spray painted with invisible ink. You'll find bios of the main villains and characters in the Batman mythos, even cryptic messages from a mysterious spirit of Arkham. They are well hidden and can be a challenge, but Riddler left maps for the areas so they're easy to find. Well, most of them. I liked taking the time to scour around for these and felt like these began as easter eggs that the creators really wanted you to find. It's a treat for both the explorer and the completionist type of players. Also, I love hearing Riddler's reactions, going from snarky in the beginning to being angry when you find a trophy in a pretty obvious spot. I thought I made them easy to find. I guess not. That one was hidden so well it was almost invisible. I'm losing patience. You're cheating. You must be. Dude, you provided me with the maps. No you enabled me to cheat. However, particular areas are blocked off until you acquire the right tools. At the start, you've got the Batarang, a versatile gadget used for hitting out of reach buttons or cutting enemies from perches. Then there's explosive gel to break down walls, which Batman oddly shrugs off. Then there's the back claw to pull down the high grates and its upgrade, the ultra back claw, which makes me question whether Batman has super strength. The line launcher lets you travel across treacherous pits. Finally, the crypto sequencer allows you to hack and turn off particular electric doors or barriers and is the only one that sees use in exploration indefinitely, but the others can be used in other scenarios to a certain extent. They aren't at their best until upgraded through the Wayne Tech menu. They contain upgrades for current devices and new moves for combat and stealth. The Crypto Sequencer is the only one whose upgrades aid in island exploration, but they are needed to get past the more complex version of the hacking minigame. There are health upgrades, but I didn't feel the need to take them until I had the rest. Now we can get to what many people remember the Arkham games for, the combat. Before you ask, no, it is not a masher like the memes or jokes will make you believe it is. Yes, you do hit a single button to hit enemies and knock them down. But then you have to counter the enemy when a blue flash appears above his head, dodge when a red one appears, and leap onto an enemy to knock him out. But be sure that you're in the clear because there is a window where you're unable to counter enemies. These elements in tandem put Batman into a state of flow knocking down enemies one after another, and the goal is to ensure the flow never breaks. This flow increases the combo counter building up over the fight, and the higher the number, the earlier you can obtain skill points to spend on combat upgrades. A few relate to gadgets, but most of my focus was on using special moves, which are active after reaching a certain threshold on the combo counter. They range from a throw that loses utility after getting the instant takedowns, which are just brutal. The quick throw battering can be helpful, but there isn't much incentive for it or any of the gadgets in combat. Mostly it's striking, countering, and takedowns that I found myself leaning towards. The complexity increases as more enemy types come into the fray. The knife enemies block attacks and cannot be countered but can be stunned before being hit. Those with electric batons must be engaged from behind, otherwise your flow stops. Remember the crazies? Yeah, they break free and wreak havoc. They're fine in single numbers, but can be somewhat challenging in groups. That is, except for, and this is a bit of a spoiler, but they were featured in the trailers, the big boys. 
These brutes cannot be fought regularly. Instead, they need to be dazed by a batarang and hit a wall before chipping their health bar. You fight one or two together at first, but with a group of thugs, you can ride these things after depleting one fraction of their health bar. Ride, my trusty steed! Ride and bring carnage upon our enemies! All of this is what creates a combat system with a unique feel. It's so visceral and fast, yet also smooth, quick, and responsive. Well, most of the time. It genuinely surprised me that the first combat encounter took only a minute. It's what other game franchises tried to replicate, but never really matched. I have played a couple of these Arkham inspired games, and while they add their own spin, they don't reach the same heights as Arkham Asylum and its sequels. Then there are the stealth sections, which are my true enjoyment of this game. It may look simple enough. Perch on the gargoyles above, and wait for an opportunity to knock them out by getting behind them. However, with enough upgrades, you could zip down from gargoyles and hang them upside down, which in the Batman universe is A-OK. -okay. Absolutely no health problems will come of this. You can use a glide attack to knock enemies over for a quick takedown. You can even pummel a guy as you would in combat. However, this is not recommended when multiple enemies are around because they can gun you down if you don't retreat to the gargoyles above. This is where gadgets start to shine. Explosive gel destroys walls, and sonic batarangs attract and can knock out enemies. The bat grapple can bring a whole floor down in a couple of instances. non lethally of course. Gotta keep that D rating. Somehow. Yet, the gadget I have consistently used throughout these encounters is Detective Vision, which identifies which criminals have guns and where they are. It can see through walls, and its range encapsulates an entire room. You can also use it to analyze your surroundings and find where weak walls or grates might be. It's a fantastic tool for preparing a plan of attack or assessing where enemies currently are. The only downside is the risk of over-relying on it so you only see blue with tints of red. Of course, new nuances get added as you go along. Enemies get hooked with suicide collars, which alert the others when you knock one of them out. It is an easy opportunity to isolate somebody or spray explosive gel next to the knocked out body as a trap. It doesn't hurt the guy, but his buddies will undoubtedly feel the impact. Also, at one point, Joker wisens up and has the gargoyles booby-trapped limiting your options to finding hiding places elsewhere, which can be problematic since these guys can shoot you almost anywhere on the ground. You will see more of this in the challenge maps, more on those later. The predator encounters are also where I better appreciate the enemy AI. Sefton Hill, the game's director, said it best during the demo. They know you're coming, but they don't know where or how. Enemies will walk along expected routes from the start. But as you take them out, they split up, desperately trying to search for you and counter your approaches, even getting up into places that are hard to grab them or walking back to back with each other. Eventually, they'll become so scared that they won't even support each other, hunting you down more frantically. You could even pop out and make them react. <gasps> Not only does it create new opportunities, but the unpredictability of the AI can make each section, especially during challenge modes, different every time you come back. The stealth in this game is superb. My only disappointment is that this hasn't been replicated by many other games, especially those that borrow Arkham's combat aspects. No enemy AI hunts you down non-stop after discovering your whereabouts, or becomes more afraid of you as you neutralize every threat. There have been games like Metal Gear Solid that get close, but not to the extent Asylum and its successors demonstrate. The fun doesn't stop in the main story, however. Challenge maps are unlocked as you discover Riddler trophies and offer specific tests. For combat maps, it's getting the highest score for not getting hit, 
keeping the flow going, and occasionally using gadgets and special moves. For the Predator maps, it's taking down thugs in specific ways and as quickly as possible, which makes you think about your approach. However, the weakest aspect of this game, in my opinion, involves the bosses. Only one of them I would consider worthy of my time, while others are just one-trick ponies. The developers may have noticed because the most challenging part came from enemy hordes throwing me off my game. They're just forgettable and uninteresting. The one boss fight that technically isn't a boss fight but is worth mentioning is Scarecrow with his hallucination levels. Just look at this first encounter. Your eyes are glowing red and the music starts playing this eerie tune with voices telling you to Even when you listen, Bruce finds himself back in the morgue with the dead bodies of his parents and... In all three, the goal is simple. Reach the bat signal at the end without getting caught. However, the different set pieces of each hallucination, how each begins, and the glimpses into Batman's inner demons and fears make them unforgettable. At least for me. Finally, let's talk about the overall story of the game. The plot is engaging, from beginning to end, especially with the cast and performances. Playing it years later, I have noticed how my perception of the narrative has changed. Teenage me saw the story beats as harmonious and perfect. I perceived many stories back then as such. However, being more of an experienced reviewer and writer, the holes are now more noticeable, mostly with character motivations and the background plot. I'm not saying the story is horrendous, but there were times when I asked, wait, how does that make sense? To explain further means going into spoiler territory, so go to here if you just want to see my conclusions. So, the big boys are infected by Titan, a variation of the super strength serum Venom, used by Bane. The Titan strain was created by one of the chief psychiatrists, Dr. Penelope Young. Joker tricked Young into creating the Titan and brought Bane in to drain him dry and sample his venom, to create an entire army of Bane clones. However, when Dr. Young wants out, Joker takes over Arkham to do the job himself. Joker's motivations are simple and easy to understand. He wants the super weapon to destroy the city. What I don't get are Dr. Young's motivations. She knows that Bane is in the medical building's basement and is personally draining his venom dry. Dr. Young, the Bruja, she drained the venom from my blood. Let's talk more about your Titan project. My what? How do you? How do I know you have Bane strapped to a table in the basement while you pump him dry? Would you believe a lucky guess? The only insight we get is Dr. Young saying her patient X is supposed to help rehabilitate the supervillains. Project Titan's goal is to create a test bed to fully probe our special cases in a safe, risk-free manner. Our goal is to cure the more unfortunate specimens, the weak, those not physically up to the challenge that our medical practices present. Project Titan will make us a world-class facility, an award-winning facility. Early results were promising. But it was only after the arrival of Patient X that our expectations were raised. Patient X was the catalyst that led to a full-scale adoption of the Titan process. We must all thank our benefactors for this opportunity. How exactly is Venom supposed to help in curing mad patients? Are there certain properties that make Venom more than just a strength drug? There must be because Titan also serves as Super Fertilizer! It's also hinted, but not confirmed, to have enhanced Scarecrow's fear toxin. It wasn't Gordon. Crane's gas must have affected me more than I thought. Dr. Young was going out of her way to get a supply of a drug with seemingly limitless potential. She only stops when Joker reveals that he's been funding her research. Blackmailing me. 
He has a crazy plan to create an army of monsters. I want out, but... It Dr. Young, you've been holding a criminal hostage and sucked the venomous life out of him just to satisfy your own intellectual curiosity. You have a lot to answer for. Oh my god! Get out of the way! Never mind, she's dead. So, how does the game end? When Joker gives Ivy Super Fertilizer! Giant roots spread across the island, and so do plants that spit poisonous spores. Luckily, there is an antidote in Killer Croc's lair, which Aaron Cash says is an old sewer below intensive treatment, the tutorial building. Along the way, we encounter Scarecrow for the famous bit already spoken of to death, but no less extraordinary, making the player think the game crashed for the third time this week, only to restart the game's intro with the Joker bringing a deranged Batman to an execution. I've waited a long time for this bat. Let's start the party with a bang. I knew I should have brought a Nintendo 64 controller. It's one of Batman's greatest fears, the nutcases running the nut house. Something that is very much happening. Recent successes with Bruce Wayne, a classic case of split personality if I ever saw one, have submitted our reputation as a pioneer in slaughterhouse. Batman resists the toxin for the final time, leaving Scarecrow flabbergasted and motivated to poison the water supply. Unfortunately, Killer Croc has other plans for him. We make it to Croc's lair, which looks suspenseful at a first glance, but it's not. Just crouch walk, knock him out with a batarang occasionally, and run when prompted. Do this until you have enough antidote, and head back to the entrance for an explosive finish. Finally, with enough antidote, you can head to the botanical gardens and face Ivy in a... honestly annoying fight. The sprawling thickets have ridiculous hitboxes, and the hypnotized minions keep distracting me because the camera is at an angle where I can't pay attention to both them and Ivy at the same time. Whatever, blow her up, but not kill her, I guess, and you win. But it's not over. Batman is invited to Joker's hideaway, and the criminals will let you go peacefully. But the achievement for beating them up is easy. We finally face Joker. Ten. Nine. Eight. Seven, six, five, four. I walked as far away from that as possible. We face his minions, and then we finally face Joker. But he reveals the ace up his sleeves. Your old pal, Commissioner Gordon. Mind you, we rescued him once already. Why did we do that just for him to be kidnapped again? Joker infects Batman with Titan before infecting himself, which, I will admit, makes him look both terrifying and formidable. He keeps goading Batman to change too, but remember that he never cured Ivy's plants of Titan. He still has an antidote on him, so he uses it. Now, it's time for the worst boss fight ever. You realize quickly that you can run around in circles to avoid Joker's attacks, and he gives up to let his henchmen take over with a couple of exploding teeth thrown in for good measure. For whatever reason, he even gets distracted by a news copter to let us pull him down with the back grapple and beat him up. Repeat two more times and get this cutscene. I'll never let you win. <laughs> never. There is an achievement for just watching Joker get punched in the jaw. Ah, <laughs> oh, these games. With Joker stopped, the police restore order to Arkham Island. And what does Batman do? Go off to stop more crime. It's a bit overkill, but what else can you expect from Batman? 
Playing through this game again really felt like going back to my teenage years. Playing games like this to death while having to worry about the stresses of school and homework. It was a fun, nostalgic run, reminding me of why I loved Arkham Asylum. A fluid combat system, stealth with some intelligent AI, and a story I found engaging, even though I see the glaring flaws. Its influence has been felt in the superhero and gaming industries, with the likes of Shadow of Mordor and Spider-Man PS4 emulating and experimenting with the gameplay system. Not to mention, it proved that superhero games can be a viable genre with quality experiences. It's not just a game or a stepping stone. It's a turning point I remember fondly, along with many others. While I recommend playing this game if you haven't, this is only the beginning. Rocksteady was already teasing a sequel in the depths of the Warden's office, and the sequel... Well, that's a story for another day, and I look forward to it. So, if you want to catch my review of it and the sequels to come, subscribe or follow the channel and hit the bell icon. Don't forget to leave a like and a comment with your opinions of Arkham Asylum and what you like or dislike most about it. Also, if you are watching me for the first time, check out my first few videos where I review and analyze my favorite Sherlock Holmes games. Also, thanks for watching and welcome aboard. I'll see you all in the next one. Hey, Dad, go easy on him. For me. Oh, hell, what do I care? Do your worst! <laughs> <laughs>